So, um, hello everyone, welcome and um, welcome to our uh, amazing panel. Robin Klein needs no introduction. Uh, investor, entrepreneur, partner with Index, boards of lots of companies we'll all know very well. Uh, Zoopla, Mood, One's Fine Stay, Money Supermarket. Uh, really and a friend and mentor to so many people in the industry. Uh, Robin's a, what you might call a true industry legend whose passion for entrepreneurship uh, is as uh, strong as ever. Andy Cantor, uh, best known for his long, illustrious career uh, at Autonomy, where he was Chief Operating Officer from 2001 uh, until um, just uh, following Autonomy's acquisition by HP last year. Currently partner at Invoke, and also a partner in a restaurant uh, uh, on whose uh, website he's described as a random dog walker. Ed Ray began his uh, career in banking uh, before founding, uh, co-founding Betfair in 1999, where he was chief executive and then chairman. Of course, Betfair IPO'd uh, 2010, London Stock Exchange, 1.4 uh, billion pound valuation, was really seen as a flagship uh, uh, or standard bearer rather for the European tech scene. Ed's currently uh, uh, angel investing and uh, uh, recently tweeted about the prominence uh, given to um, Morrissey's autobiography on Channel 4 News. Uh, he wasn't very happy about that. Orna Holland, uh, Senior Director of Global Talent at King, uh, having built an extraordinary career in uh, HR uh, and recruitment, uh, helping Microsoft, Google, and Facebook uh, extend uh, uh, or uh, grow their uh, European teams, and indeed for Facebook, um, oversaw the opening of the first uh, non-US engineering office in London. Um, Orna recently showcased on Pinterest uh, a rather fetching um, Osborne and Little wallpaper design featuring a blue, uh, a, a, a blue tree motif. Um, Dimitrios Zopos, uh, co-founder and chief operating officer uh, of One Fine Stay, followed a brilliant academic career uh, with spells at McKinsey, the World Bank, uh, and various entrepreneurial roles. He's described by his co-founder, Greg Marsh, uh, as someone who doesn't bite unless provoked, uh, and who eats all colours of M&Ms. So please join me in welcoming our panel. So um, today's topic uh, is hiring for hypergrowth. It's no secret that hiring fast and effectively is both um, important and extremely difficult. Um, members of our panel have largely got it right, and I guess like you, I want to find out how they did it. Uh, so let's crack on. I'm going to spend the first uh, 20 minutes firing questions at the panel. Uh, and then I'm going to open it to the audience. So please uh, do have a think about the questions you'd like to ask. Um, I'm going to start by asking a question to the panel as a whole, um, which is this. Um, how do you go about resolving the tension between hiring fast and hiring well? And uh, who looks like they may have an answer top of head? Uh, let me start with Robin. Um, hiring fast and hiring well. I, I'm a great believer in hiring fast and doing so, um, sh should I say, uh, speculatively in the early stages. Hiring really smart people, not necessarily those with deep domain expertise, but at, at the early stage, you're looking for people with enthusiasm, who love the business, and who are, you know, have the intellectual horsepower to grow with the business. So that's at, at very early stage. And I think you can take some risks at that, at that point. So you trust your instinct. I mean, later on, um, I think that's, it's a different question. Ed. I think, I, I agree with all of that. I think the key is, as with anything, when you're building a business, you've got to be prepared to fail. So, you know, if you hire, 10 people, they are not all going to be right. Mm. And you have to, I think, recognize that. If you're scared about hiring the wrong people, it will take you too long to hire the right people. You won't get them all right, um, so you've got to act on that as well. So I, I think when you look at this whole topic, it isn't just hiring, it's managing people for hypergrowth, because actually another part of the equation is how people, the wrong people, if you brought them in, have to go out at yes. the same time. Yes. So we'll come on to that, but um, Orna, um, can a gap in the leadership team, do you think, ever sort of justify compromising um, on candidate quality or, or, or suitability? Uh, a gap in the leadership team, I mean, that happens all the time. 
Um, I don't think that you can take risks when you're putting people in charge of an organization. Yeah. I think I agree with what the guide said, um, but I think you have to you have to hire fast, but you have to hire to your company's culture, what that means to the organization um, and how that affects the day to day. So you can hire fast and if you hire to cultural fit, you normally get it right. Gaps in leadership happen all the time. You've got to make sure that you have uh, the right senior people in place. You can take risks with junior people who have the smarts, who can, I, I've seen people being hired as junior members of a team and they're now directors and in some cases VPs within organizations that I worked in. So you're, you're absolutely right in saying that. But I do think with gaps uh, at very senior levels, you can take risks. Andy, can you maybe perhaps give us a, an idea of um, the scale of autonomy when you joined and then it's scale when you left, and, and tell us how you, you looked at this. So we were about 150 when I joined, and we were about 3,000 when I left. Um, I guess kind of looking at those, those two questions, um, speed versus getting it right, I, I think it all comes down to deciding what your culture is and what your criteria are for hiring and then hiring into those criteria, and don't compromise them. Mm -hmm. So that actually fits into both. Um, Hiring is an entirely random process, and all that you're doing in setting up a process to hire people is trying to minimize the random element of it. So whether you're at one end where you ask somebody a random question or you're at the Google end where you've come up with a 20-page um, uh, problem that somebody's got to solve, all you're trying to do is minimize the random element of it. Right. Um, figure out what those criteria are that are important to you, stick to them, and then go with it. It means that you can move with speed. Um, but the other thing, particularly at hiring at the senior level and that gap in senior leadership, is go with your gut. Because at the end of the day, if you think it's wrong, it probably is. And the damage that can be done by hiring that wrong person into the management team is exponentially larger than whatever you think they might have brought. Can you, can you give us any, any examples, obviously without mentioning names, where, where a bad hire at, at, at senior level has, has led to sort of long-term um, issues? Um, sure, it, it was actually pretty early days, but we had hired in a senior sales person to become basically global head of sales. Um, and really without us knowing, without us paying attention, um, he had entirely revamped the entire selling process and sales criteria and presentations and the like. Um, and the problem wasn't that we didn't necessarily need improvement. The problem was, was it was kind of done as a cowboy effort, um, trying to hide it from us. And the net result was that five years of hard learned lessons that had gone into what we sold and how we sold and what we did, it got ignored. Um, in favor of, I don't know, some things that he may have learned out of a textbook. Um, and so in that case, it, it was really missing the signs that this was a person who wanted to do what they wanted to do without actually involving the rest of the management team and the people who had built up the years of experience. All right. Dimitrios, uh, one fine stay is, uh, is a somewhat unusual business model. I know you're growing very, very fast, but you have particular requirements uh, and uh, requirements which are, which are perhaps not present in, 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 in many other companies um, in, in our industry. So how do you go about you know, scaling up quickly, but without compromising on candidate suitability or quality? It's hard work, and I think that the, the trade-off between quality and speed we, we just were just discussing now, I think, is, is a little bit overrated. I don't think that there is such a trade-off in reality. I think, like any other endeavor, uh, it, it's a hard thing to solve. It requires effort, it requires sort of love and attention, it requires sort of due, uh, due, due attention. I think that the key thing is that if the the founders and the senior management are all committed to ensuring that hiring is a competence in the company that everybody takes care, then it's not, somebody, it's not something that is, is going to be perceived as being possible to be done easily. It's a hard thing to do. And interestingly, it's probably the single most important determinant of success of startups. If you don't do that well, it can be, can be death. Uh, if you do it fantastically, you can be a, a great startup. So I always say that uh, hiring well is like, uh, it's, like uh, it's someone's what to do. You just don't know if you're going to be Napoleon or Wellington. <laughs> so, could, yes, could I just add to that? Because I think you know we talked about cultures being so important. The proportion of time that the CEO spends hiring is a great indicator of the potential success of the business, in in, in my experience. And um, there, there can be a tendency among some to feel that it's a non-productive activity because you're doing quite a lot of work without getting a result. And for people who are very results oriented, as most founders are, that feels like really hard work. The best founders are the ones that are uh, you know, at a place like this at a conference and they're pitching everybody they see to come and work for them. 
because they are constantly hiring, because their, their businesses are growing so fast, that they'll always find a place for the, for the talented people. I, I think that's key. If you find a great person, don't worry if you haven't got the perfect pigeonhole to get them on now. Bring them on, because your organization is going to move so quickly that you know, the organization will grow into them as much as the other way around. So, so, that's, um, so that's a very interesting point, because that suggests that actually having a talent pipeline is in, in many ways just as important as, as, as sort of you know, the, the kind of, the more um, sort of event-driven or, or sort of opportunistic approach. And how, how do you, how did you think about institutionalizing that, um, if at all? Or, or was it a question of just being incredibly opportunistic and when the right person came along, um, snapping them up? I, I, I don't think we did it particularly well, actually. I mean, I think we let a, some very good people go because we weren't quite sure where they were going to fit in. Um, and if I had my time again, then I would just, you know, I'd always bring them in because I say, at the very least, you're just you're upgrading your pool. So I think you're on. I, I totally agree with Robin's point that when you're starting a business, you sometimes go, "Gosh, you know, there's so many things I've got to do. Have I really got time to go and meet lots of people to sort of think about?" Mine was given up. Um, uh, am I going to sort of you know, have I got the time to go and do it? And it's such a good investment of time of your time. Um, and you meet great people the whole time, and you've got to be, I think you do have to be reasonably opportunistic about it. If you see a great person, get them on board. I don't know anyone's ever regretted that. So this is, uh, this is a process that you can be good at, but obviously, as I think you've all acknowledged, it's not a, it's not a science, and sometimes you're, you're a Napoleon rather than a Wellington. And I guess that leads to the question of uh, rectifying mistakes, letting people go. I, I've heard it said that no one has ever regretted firing anyone too soon. Uh, is that something that anyone in the panel would agree with or strongly disagree with? I'll go. I, yeah. <laughs> I think when you say, you know, you, you move fast and you act fast in hiring, you have to act uh, even faster in correcting the mistakes that you make. Um, it sounds pretty aggressive, but uh, it works because when you're in a team and there's one person who's, you know, being unproductive and not bringing anything to that team, you will lose the rest of the team if you don't action that. Uh, a, pl a players don't want to work with B or C or D players. So you've got to move even faster when getting people out of the organization that aren't right. That's a really good point. So uh, again, just, just pushing on that, Orna, I think there's probably very few people who would disagree with that in principle. Mm -hmm. Equally, I can't think of an example of a company that does that particularly well. It's much easier to hire than it is to fire in, in most cases. We're all human, and it's quite, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, that's what it comes down to. I think we all know intellectually it's the right thing to do. The delays are often, we make excuses for, you know, ourselves and for, for others. But, uh, you know, you've got to face up to it, and, and uh, once done, as you say, it, one never regrets it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you handle it the best you can with the employee, given the parameters that you've got to work with. Um, so exit them as, as best as you can and make sure the people inside your company understand that it's your culture to be working with the best people. Mm -hmm. You made a mistake. Uh, this person wasn't up to working with them. Uh, and so we're going to keep building the team so that everybody's the best that can be. And the main issue, I think, is the dilemma for the person who is actually on the hook, the person who is managing the person mm -hmm. who, is, who is leaving. Um, it's always tempting to say that it will be easier. Let's give them another chance. They're already sort of managing a team or a bunch of things. It's easier in the short term. Who is going to take it over? And it's always tempting to think that by not doing something or fudging it, mm -hmm. you might buy yourself time. But the reality is that it's always worse in the long yeah. run. I've never seen it where it's the other way around. I, there's, a, there's another angle to this as well, I think, which, again, a mistake I think we made a lot, which was when you have someone who's reaching their ceiling in the organization, mm -hmm. That's the hardest one to deal with. They've been a great employee. And at that point, do you, the temptation often is to bring someone in alongside them to sort of help them and to sort of split the job into two. The problem then is you have two sort of often mediocre people rather than one great person. And you slow, you know, things slow down incredibly quickly. I mean, you know, this is all about, we're talking about hyper growth. I mean, yeah. you, you can't put too many barriers in the way to, you know, growth slows at the first opportunity. And so, however hard the problem seems today, however it's a decision you want to duck, it will be twice as bad tomorrow. It'll be mm -hmm. twice as bad the day after that, and it just you know it snowballs very quickly. Good. Let's um, let's turn to to international expansion. I mean, there's there's a this is an extraordinary conference uh, for lots of reasons, but but particularly in the in the sheer array of um, of nationalities here, lots and lots of companies that are uh, emerging as international players, and some of some of which have been international players for some time. Orna, you've uh, 
you've made something of a, of a specialty in, in building out international teams. Um, what are some of the pitfalls that you've, um, that you've encountered and, and how have you avoided them? So I guess all hiring now is international. When you're talking about the technologies that we're looking for, those people are coming from all over the world. Even if your company is just based in London and you're hiring people into London, we don't have the skill set that's needed. You need to bring people um, from all around the world. So understanding legislation in each geography and operating your business in line with that legislation. Um, a lot of the time, when I worked for uh, Facebook and Google and Microsoft, US-based uh, firms expanding in Europe and really didn't understand the legislation um, over in Europe, what they could and couldn't do, and made some mistakes um, based on that. So it's really important that you understand the geography that you're going into, the legislation that affects that geography, the cultures within those geographies. So if you're hire, if you're opening an office in uh, a European headquarters in London versus if you're opening an, uh, an APAC office in India, very different cultures, very different hiring process, very different do's and don'ts. Um, understand the new ways of hiring. So. If I was sitting here five years ago, I probably wouldn't talk about Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Well, I would have spoken about YouTube. Uh, the different tools that you can use, you've got to stay hot, you've got to stay current with what's going on in the market. Um, again, hire junior people with potential. Hire really strong senior people initially when you come in get them in place and they will build teams around them. If you hire junior people and you're running the organization, you'll just end up running a whole load of junior people uh, and probably won't get to where you want to so go. That's an interesting point. So your view is that you, you start off by, by making your, 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 most, your most senior hires. Yeah. But then there's the question about um, whether you go out to the local markets and you hire from the local markets or whether you start by taking somebody from the mothership, so to speak and then putting them in markets and then building teams around them. What if, what if um, perhaps someone else in the panel can ask this, what, what, what have you seen works for yeah, you? Well, we had the experience at One Fine Stay. Uh, we, we started in London and then we launched New York and then we launched Paris and now we just launched LA as well. And the experience we had is that we, we have a fairly complex operation that requires a lot of context, a lot of contextual knowledge. And what worked for us is to actually take somebody who is a native of that market, who understands the market, but has experience, significant experience, just time immersing them in the in the original uh, business. Right. So, for example, we launched New York. Had Evan Frank, who runs our US operations. He spent a year basically planning the business in London before being shipped out to New York. We did the same thing for for Paris. We had six months stint uh, in a variety of roles in the operating business in London before sending Kevin out to Paris, and we did the same thing with Los Angeles. And I think this works very well because you get the best of both worlds. You need both the local knowledge, local uh, context, but also you need the understanding of how something works. Robin, you've, you've obviously had experience with lots and lots of different businesses in lots of different territories. Um, is, that, is there anything that, that you've heard that, that resonates particularly? Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. I just add, I think that the biggest challenge uh, with splitting any organization, whether it's internationally or even just down the road, is uh, communication. And um, you know, you've got to actively work at communicating all the time. You've got to over-communicate almost because if you're not in the same office and you're not around the water cooler or in the corridors or whatever, you, know, you, do, you, you do see a breakdown of, of, of cultures and uh, effectiveness. So you know, the stress on communication, I think, is, is key once you've made those hires and you've established your, your outpost. Shouldn't even think of it as an outpost. That's the first mistake. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, our approach to foreign territories was, in an ideal world, sending somebody over whose sole job was to put themselves out of a job. To, to, uh, they're over there to find the person that's going to run the business. You're sending somebody over because they're one of you, uh, but they also have to become one of them. Uh, and it's impossible to straddle both worlds. So the ideal is to find somebody who's local. Send somebody, find somebody local, bring, bring that person up. So, um, turning now to uh, the, the sort of again an ongoing question about whether to hire for experience or, or raw talent, and, and really what what sort of combination makes sense for your business and at various phases of your business's uh, growth. I mean, Ed, I guess from the outside, uh, Bedfair seems at least to me to be the kind of business that really required a combination of sort of industry or domain expertise, but obviously talent, ambition. Uh, and all the rest of it. How did you go about striking that balance as you scaled up? I, 
think a lot depends on what you know where on the on the timeline you are. I mean, to begin with, undoubtedly, we went for you know raw talent um, because we weren't quite sure how everything was going to evolve, and we wanted people to be able to adapt very quickly. Um, as the organisation became larger, uh, then I think you have to have you know you need some experience there. Um, I don't think it's necessarily 50-50. I would probably always err on the side of talent mm. more. Um, and experience less, but I think you have to sort of, you know, you, you do need to have a combination. Um, the key is the chemistry between the talent and the experience, and making sure that the experience is getting the most out of the talent, um, because if they're fighting each other, then you've, you've got a, a tough problem. Um, but I think, again, I, I can't stress enough that the way an organisation evolves, and I'll do, I really speak from one example, I don't think we could really see how it was going to evolve. We didn't really know. And so the danger is if you hire people for what you think is going to be or what feels comfortable today, then it's going to, you're going to hit, run out of road very, very quickly there. So often some of these people come in, they don't necessarily feel like they probably fit in because actually if you've got it right, they won't necessarily fit for now. They'll fit for where you're going to be in, in 12 or 18 months' time. And so I, I think you know, talent, you know you, what they're going to do. Robin. Yeah, I think the timing of bringing in the domain expertise is is critical. Uh, I think of uh, you know one of the one of the great successes here, uh, Wonga, and I think about the way Errol set his stall out right from the beginning. What he deliberately did not want anybody from the financial services industry, and he himself hadn't come from it because he was essentially reinventing stuff, and he didn't want people to come with the with their set ideas as to how, how they'd go about it. But clearly, once the business got quite a lot bigger and uh, got into the areas of regulation, et cetera, et cetera, you know, people who've done this before do make a difference. So I think it's a question of timing, uh, definitely both, both required. But integrating very experienced corporate executives with deep domain expertise into a uh, entrepreneur-led business is a is another challenge. So how I mean again, what approaches have you seen work uh, in terms of integrating uh, experienced uh, executives, and, and what are the things to avoid? You know, that's a tough one to answer because ultimately it comes down to relationships and what we call chemistry, mm. whatever that you know undefined um, term means. But um, I think. Essentially, corporate, corporate managers really need to be quite realistic about what they're getting into and, and founders need to be very realistic about what their expectations are um, of, of a corporate manager. So, you know, a very, very honest, open discussion, um, which can take hours, days and weeks, uh, is essential. I want to, uh, I work for Google and, and I know that Google never placed, at least when I was there, very much store on domain expertise uh, or, or experience, except in a very general term. So if you're entering into a business development role, you would have ex expected to have had some business development experience, but really no, no more than that. It was much more around academics, around talent, around mm -hmm. initiative, and really your performance during the interview process. It always struck me that that actually, in, in some ways, dictates the shape of the company mm -hmm. uh, as much as being a product of the shape of the company because you end up with a whole bunch of generalists. Is that something, I, I'm not sure how it works with Facebook or with Microsoft, but certainly that was the case with Google. Um, what's been your experience uh, at, uh, for example, Facebook and now at King? Um, and I think Google have changed their, their hiring model. I left there in uh, 2009, so I think it has changed a little bit. They're doing kind of uh, scrubs on their data. They're going out into the internet and doing all types of things. But I mean, I respect their business model. Their business model hasn't changed from 2004, where uh, the founders still review every single candidate that gets hired at Google. They review their resume, their academics, um, where they've come from, and if they're a fit for the culture for the organization. And the organization is going from strength to strength. I, I think the share price is over $1,000 at the moment. So. They're obviously, they, they've done a pretty good job yeah. uh, in hiring and setting up the business. Um, they, hire, they always hired good people. Um, they didn't hire B players, that was the, yes. the, the internal uh, conversation. Um, Facebook and, and Google were very similar in that they hired very much people, smart people uh, who fitted with, to the company mission and the culture. 
Um, and my experience for, with King, and I've been there uh, all of two months, is uh, culture, culture is king uh, within that organization. So uh, there's a similar strain between all of them where th there is a real focus on culture. And I think every company says, oh, we hired culture. But what does that actually mean? I, I always say to people, well, what questions do you ask uh, around culture? How do you evaluate the, the cultural fit for this organization? What did you ask the person? And sometimes it turns out they say, oh, well, I just didn't want to go to the pub with that guy and have a pint. I'm like, OK, well, that's not really around culture. Um, so you've got to really uh, get people to focus on what the mission of the company is, what the culture of the company is, and how they hire to fit those boxes. Um, I think all companies, all the companies I've worked for, do that, uh, just in different ways. Um, there is a different culture within all of those organizations, but very similar, all very fast paced, uh, high growth, um, at scale, uh, and all approaching it in a very strategic uh, way, um, some a little more organized than others. Let's, let's focus on culture, because this is obviously a key issue. It's been raised a number of times. And I'm really fascinated, particularly, to hear from um, Ed and Andy, who really have been involved in companies right from the beginning that have achieved massive scale uh, very quickly. And the, I suppose the question is, how do you preserve your company culture through that period of very, very fast hiring? Uh, I'll throw another twist into it of um, growth by acquisition as well. So how do you yeah. wind up... Uh, Communicating the culture across, um, you know, when your organization grows by 50% overnight or more, um, I, it's a constant communication of the values that are important to you. Constant. Um, sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we weren't. Um, and you can definitely see the results when you're not good at it. You, you begin to see, start seeing it in failures in the hiring process. Um, and you take a step back and you try to figure out um, why have we begun to hire mediocre people, and you realize that. Well, it's because we've started allowing mediocre people to hire mediocre people, and you're in that death spiral. Mm -hmm. And what defines the mediocre person is, well, they're not really bought into the culture, and they don't fully understand it. And it always led us back to this idea that, that we had gotten particularly bad, because we had been distracted by other things, about communicating simply what was important to us, whether it was on the employee side, on the customer side, on the long-term vision of the, um, of the company. Uh, but whenever we lagged, it clearly was around the fact that we just didn't spend enough time talking to people. I think, you know, we've said it a number of times, communication. Um, it gets exponentially more difficult. It gets harder when you go out of one room into two, one floor to two, one office to two, one country to two. I mean, it just gets harder and harder. I think also, ironically here, technology makes life harder as well. Because, you know, when we started, yes, email was around, but you still actually face-to-face -face was sort of the norm. Um, and the danger with a lot of communication is people say, well, I've sent the email, therefore I've done my job. And you haven't. Communication is very much a sort of interactive two-way street. So. I mean, I think however much you think you need to do it, sort of double that, almost. Um, I think the other thing is as you grow fast, what really um, disillusions people, I think, is how things can slow down, how more and more people get involved. And you have to continually streamline your decision-making processes. You have to sort of say to people, look, yes, this might have been your, you, know, you might have had a tick in this box, you know, right to tick this box last week. You're not going to now because if we only ever add people, it's just going to slow down. And then one other thing which I think is interesting, when you bring new people in, you know, really allow them, you know, they, they have not one degree of cynicism in them in terms of how the organization works. And cynicism it really kills a culture incredibly quickly. So really listen to them. You know, they're fresh, they're new, they've got a new perspective. And I think their observations are incredibly important. And you sort of need to probably think about those separately to how you think about everyone else in the organization. Good. Let's, um, let's get a bit more granular. Um, I think lots of people in this room are, have specific hiring challenges probably right now going through their minds thinking about who to hire. So, Dimitrios, actually, it would be really helpful um, to hear from you to, to understand, like, what roles are you currently finding hardest to fill? And how are you, what are some of the techniques that you're using to, to fill them? Well, look, I mean, uh, I, would, I would lie to you if I said that there's any role which is easy to find. Yeah. Uh, it's the nature of startups that you're trying to find people that don't really exist, that have everything. Because you, you, generally the ambit of responsibility is much wider than the title suggests. And that's what we're looking for as well when we're hiring people. But there are some particular challenges for specific roles which make them even harder than other roles. Um, certain types of roles, I call them sort of spaghetti roles, uh, where uh, they are effectively non-autonomous roles. They're not people that own a P&L or own a part of the business that can make decisions autonomous and can run the teams accordingly. Uh, a classic one is 
product development. Uh, it means different things in every single company, um, especially in the, in the sort of tech space. Uh, hiring great product developers is is the hardest thing I would say in, so in, in, in tech. Um, those people don't say have hard power, they have a lot of soft power, and they have to integrate with everybody else in the business, the marketing team, engineering team, everybody. So those are particularly hard types of, of, of roles to fill out. Um, not only at the senior level, also at the, at, the, at the more junior level as well, entry level as well. I would say the second type of role, which, um, which is also very, very challenging to hire, is where it has to span sort of left brain and right brain, um, more, the most sort of analytical uh, mindset with the, with the more uh, creative mindset. And I think Robin here mentioned John T as, as the quintessential example of, of a left brain, right brain person, but there's not that many John T's in the world. Um, and a uh, classic type of role there is a CMO, uh, a chief marketing officer. Mm -hmm. um, we have now the kind of the whole, the past 10, 15 years, you had the whole sort of rise of analytical marketing as a, as a domain of expertise that didn't exist. If you go to any of the agencies uh, sort of 20 years ago, it was like mad men. You know, it was uh, people who came from, from brand and sort of a, a right brain approach. But trying to get somebody who understands both sides, or at least appreciates both sides of the, um, of the marketing spectrum is incredibly, incredibly hard. Um, and then I would say that uh, the third type of, of hard challenge is, uh, as, as I mentioned as well, where you're trying to hire somebody who can scale up with the organization uh, with a view to scaling up quite significantly. Uh, Last example is a CIO. Uh, it's a different thing to have uh, to look after technology or infrastructure for a small team of, of five guys in a room, basically, uh, to going to a multi-location international uh, group with hundreds of people. It's it's a different level of challenge. But to find somebody who can do both is also very hard. Um, and there's others of other types of um, of challenges which are a bit more subtle, I'd say. In startups, for example, trying to hire, especially in the UK, people from the professions, hiring, for example, from an accounting profession, sounds easy. A CFO. Uh, what, what's easier than a CFO, right? Uh, well, guess what? That's not true. Uh, because, again, people who are, who are great, not in every country, they're looking for kind of the startups as being the go-to. Uh, we believe we're in this bubble, this world, but it's not, uh, you have to sell to some people. Um, Robin, you see, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of, well, you have the privilege of, I suppose, a higher level uh, view. You see lots and lots of different companies. What are some of the positions that are just famously problem positions to fill? Well, I, think, I do agree. I think product, product management is definitely uh, a, a challenge right now. But these, these things tend to change. I mean, there was a time when you know, developers were, were really, really hard to find in, in London. I think that's less the case. This is a very fast-moving industry we've got. So, uh, you know, experience is growing exponentially all the time. So there are more and more experienced people coming out onto the market. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in, uh, you know, to go right back to the first question, raw talent and, um, and build the experience on the job. There's nothing like real enthusiasm for what the company is actually doing, love of the product. And, uh, you know, I think many of those roles can be filled. I mean, the highly specialized roles, I think, uh, will, always be, will always be in demand. And I think this question about the marketing person, the left brain, right brain thing, that's, that's a problem that's always going to be here. You just don't find, uh, you know, that sort of creative brand awareness um, spark in, in the highly analytical marketeer that many of our businesses uh, need. But what you need there is a great manager who can manage both sides. So uh, does anyone in the audience uh, have any questions for our, for our panel? Yes. Um, so does somebody have a... Oh, there we go. And if you could introduce yourself, please. I'm Max Cavalieri from Alpha Sites. And I have a question around international recruiting. So if you face a more or less global recruiting challenge in, say, America and in Europe and Asia, um, how would you organize the actual recruiting function? Um, would you have rather junior recruiters locally reporting to the local or regional managers? Um, or would you have an integrated global recruiting function with a senior recruiting manager heading it somewhere and then kind of dictating it to the other regions how the more junior people should actually go about it? Would be very interested if any of you had 
views on, on either model of organization? I, I can take a crack uh, at one first day. The way we do this is depends, of course, on the level of seniority. We're looking, for example, at uh, general managers here for US, Europe, uh, uh, Asia Pacific. Our rule now is that if we find a great general manager for location, we'll hire them. And in fact, we'll actually launch location on the basis that there is a great general manager in place. So for us, that kind of hire is strategic in the sense that one of the co-founders of the senior team will have to take charge of that recruitment. And there's a name against, um, uh, against uh, one of us to do that. And what we tend to do is uh, we, we tend to um, actually take the first, because the first touch points are always us, effectively. Uh, we get some local support in terms of the process, but the, we, we are selling ourselves to the candidate as well. We're selling the organization, the, the concept to them first and foremost. So um, it's not so much about devolving responsibilities, it's about how much time can we spend. Of course, we do things like Skype interviews first or uh, other things like that, but ultimately, it's a multi-stage process, and the question is how much time do we spend on that, and the answer is a lot. Do, do your recruiters in America recruit into a manager America, or do they, do they recruit into your senior recruiting manager, um, you know, global out of London? So that's the key question. How do you organize I, the actual recruiting function? I, I think it depends where you are within the organization uh, in the growth. If you're looking to hire a number of people into Europe, there's not much point in setting a whole function up there. But in my experience, I have seen if you're, hire, if you're going to hire a load of junior recruiters into an area or a region, they need leadership. So, and they need local leadership because uh, if you're talking London to the US, you've got an eight hour difference. Um, you've got uh, people in the US who don't understand what it's like to hire into London, the different challenges that you face, um, what the pipeline looks like here, you know, events like this that people go to. They just don't have the localized information that's needed to be successful. So in my experience, you can start off wherever your headquarters is and start to hire the key people into the organization there, hire a leadership role for recruitment, and then start to hire junior people into the organization. Again, when the organization scales, that can sometimes flip back. But that, in my experience, I've seen work. You start off at the headquarters, wherever that is, um, you put key people in to your operating business, um, and then you run it locally. Any other questions? Uh, yes, over there. George Caribbean from Judo Payments. Uh, real simple question. Uh, what would be your killer interview question if your entire interview was reduced to a single question? <laughs> and Robin, I'm really interested in yours. But, uh, <laughs> but if we have time, everybody. Uh, I, I got mine. Mine was simple. It's, tell me what you think our company does. That, it was that simple, and it was astonishing, the number of people, senior salespeople that would come and go, well, you know, I didn't have time to, to read up on you on the internet. Done. And that's it. It was that simple. Yeah, I, 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 guess, uh, I guess mine, I don't know if it's killer, but the one I often ask is, why do you want to join this company? Which I guess is not that far away uh, from Andy's uh, question. Is you know, why do you want to join us? So, you know, it, it, it forces the answer, tell me about, about the, the business and uh, what you think is great about it. Because coming back to my earlier points, I think enthusiasm for the business that you're going to join is absolutely key. Genuine enthusiasm, love, love of it. Love the product, love the, the customers, lo love the industry, whatever. You, you've got to be passionate. Just on that one, just ask them how much they've used your product. Because amazing how many people will come into an interview, say, I love this business, I think it's great. And then, you know, in our, I'd say, so how long have you had an account? And they go, uh, well, I don't actually have one. Just you know, actions speak louder than words. I have so many questions. But uh, <laughs> uh, one of the questions that I get a good reaction out of, and, and I've learned a lot from people because they kind of question themselves, I say, tell me about the biggest mistake you've made in your career to date. Um, they're surprised by it, and it's not even so much the question. Then I say, what learning have you taken from that? So it's really to understand, you know, everybody makes mistakes. It's about the fact that they can admit to the mistake they've made and turn it around and, uh, and how they've learned from that. If people can't answer that question for you, you don't want them working mm. with you. There's a question uh, over here you had. Sorry, do, do, you, do you still have a question? Yes. You do. 
Uh, my name is Jens. I'm from Klarna. We're currently growing uh, a lot. So uh, one interesting question for me, maybe you answered some of it already, but uh, your you know, speaking about culture and how do you, you keep sort of the same culture globally, what is for you the most important value culturally that you look for and how do you find it in sort of two, three interviews or how many interviews you know that you do? I can start, I think for, for me and for the business as a whole, I'd say is that drive is the most important thing. Uh, there's no substitute for drive in my view because yeah, you can uh, you can somehow acquire down the line. It's a, it's a personal trait that we tend to tend to. Hello, and it's uh, it's something you tend to um, uh, to be able to test. It's a testable thing. So the question I ask is that uh, what's what's your biggest failure? Uh, give me a few examples. Give me another example of a failure. Uh, what's your biggest flaw? So it's showing, trying to get people to demonstrate to you um, how you overcome adversity, how you tried. And, and fail. Uh, so drive is the single most important thing. Sorry, Dimitris, do you want to use that, that That's right. Yeah. So drive is the single most important thing, and it's um, it's something which uh, is very, very hard to, to acquire subsequently. We have other values as well. We're looking for uh, three or four different things, but drive for me is, uh, is the number one. Ed, you, so, um, so culturally, people who, find, people who say yes, not no, find a reason to say yes, not a reason to say no. Impact people who make an impact. Hmm. Any other any other questions? Hands up. Yes. In the corner. Thank you, Pete Alexander from the Up Group. Um, we've talked a bit about strategic hires and um, specialist hires, like a CTO, for example, where the person, right person today, might not be the right person in two years' time. Um, given the comments around culture and hiring for talent and what have you, have you ever made a hire with the knowledge that that person might not be within the business in two years' time? So, or would you always hire for a, a more talented person with the potential? Anybody want to have a crack at that? The answer is, is yes. Uh, our, our first few hires were almost invariably in that box. Uh, whether you, you actually plan for them not to be in the business or not is probably not, not, the, uh, not the right approach, but um, the odds of someone making it in the first two years in a startup are very low regardless of whether you intend to or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, in our case, yeah, we have uh, plenty of hires who we thought may not necessarily scale, but the intention, our intention is to always find people, especially early on, that will scale the business. And that's where you have to go for the smarts and the drive and the, uh, I would say, the generic quality as opposed to specific experience. I always hire, uh, I would say, general qualities, four general qualities. I look out for those uh, at the expense of uh, specific experience. Uh, does anyone else, uh, anyone else want to answer that? Let me, let, let me uh, so are, are, there, are there any other questions? Um, uh, there's a, oh, we have a follow up. <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, there are, I mean, a, Q, a few key traits that you want to test. Um, one of them is the reaction to the random, um, uh, which is seeing the reaction is more important than the answer. Um, and just other general kind of cultural things that you're trying to imbue as part of it. As it scales, I mean, I can't remember who asked the question about hiring globally, but you know, with a bit of luck and, and, and touch wood, pretty soon you're going to be in a situation in which you've got a local HR manager reporting to the senior HR manager hiring on behalf of a local sales manager via a local recruiter. And mm -hmm. how are you going to maintain your quality <laughs> through that process? And again, what I said at the very beginning, given that hiring is a random process in which you're trying to minimize the random element, you do everything you can to do it. And standard questions are one way of doing it. Uh, standard uh, kind of roles into which you're hiring is another way. Standard pay scales. Uh, is another way. And all these things, by the way, are lock standard and don't change until they do. Um, so you're constantly reviewing everything that you're doing in the process. But um, if you don't have a process, you can't scale. It'll fall apart very quickly. We have very strict processes. <laughs> 
So I back everything you said up, absolutely, because you could have you could have a, a company policy where people have to do eight interviews, let's say, and you've got eight people going in there all asking the exact same question, you might as well just do one interview. That's an example of a process failure. So, look, in the interest of time, we've, we've got a couple of minutes uh, left. I, I just want to end by asking, I suppose, each of you uh, one question, which is this. What, what do you consider to have been your single greatest hire? If you can look back on your career and think, what one person either really made the difference or did I, did I, did I really knock, knock it out of the park? And, but crucially, what, what are the generalizable lessons from that? You could have given us a bit of warning on that one. Well, I didn't yeah. want to, Robin. Is anyone going to have a crack at that? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it, other than my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Leave aside the higher part in that. Um, it's, uh, it was the very first time that I hired somebody who I knew was smarter and better and more talented than I was. Uh, it was the best hire I ever did in San Francisco um, because I was based here out of London, she was in San Francisco, and she grew that organization quicker than I ever could have. And it was the first time I got over that, that fear of hiring above yourself. Um, but again, it goes back to what I said before about mediocrity hiring mediocrity. Um, if you let mediocre people hire, they'll inevitably hire even more mediocre people and it's the death spiral. But if you keep the hiring um, senior decisions at the senior level, um, with, if it really goes well, they'll be hiring people who are smarter and theoretically will take their jobs. Best hire I ever did. Ed, you look like you want to answer this one. No, I, I feel like I don't want to answer this one. <laughs> I, I think I have to say the last hire I made before I left, which was the new chief executive, Brian Corcoran, just yeah. because I was entrusting in him, you know, 10 years of a business or 12 years of a business. Um, and that's a big decision. And I knew I'd made the right decision when I walked out the door and was totally happy to walk out and not feel like I had to pick up the phone and say, how's it going? And what about that process? What made it such a great hire? I mean, it can't have been luck. You must have... Um, no, it's an interesting one because a lot of people had, you know, I, I don't take the credit for, for finding him. You know, a lot of people, his name came up through, from a lot of different people. Um, we ran a... I think we did actually run a, a good, exhaustive process. Um, but there's something very satisfying when it clicks in that process and everyone who interacts comes back, you know, and you, you sort of ask everyone, it's a bit like a blind tasting, you ask them all for their, you know, their mm -hmm. favorite and it's just very clear and it was just, you know, it was a very easy decision for us to make um, and so far the proof is in the pudding as yeah. well. Okay, well, I, I haven't hired uh, many people in the last 15 years, so... Uh, what, can I adapt the question to yes, say, you, uh, you know, yes, which means. is the best sort of entrepreneur that, that I've backed? And this is normally a very, very tough question because I love them all and, the, and, and they really, <coughs> and there are a lot of very great ones. But I have to say that uh, Errol Damlin is a standout uh, entrepreneur um, who um, I kind of knew almost immediately that he was, uh, was going to build a very big successful business, although it took us nine months before we were both happy that uh, we would uh, proceed. What were the two or three qualities that you saw in him? Well, it's very single-minded uh, focus um, and um, at the same time very thoughtful and analytical. Orna, are you going to have a crack at this question? Uh, I mean, I, I've hired hundreds of people, uh, so I can't. I, I think the, the the biggest hire for me was when I uh, was going on maternity leave. I hired somebody to replace me to do my job, and I did such an excellent job that I uh, basically didn't have a job when I came back, which was a, a funny situation. But it actually uh, led me to my next role. Um, within the organization, I didn't leave the organization. I went down a, a different path, which was, you know, an amazing experience for me. And again, to your point, it's it, it's around hiring somebody who is better than you, who, you know, it it, it doesn't come naturally to people, um, but it's the best hire you'll ever make. Somebody that you want to work for. Somebody you want to work for. Dimitros, yeah. would you subscribe to that? Uh, definitely. Uh, I always try to hire people who are better than me in all respects, if I can. And um, I think I, I can name names. Uh, Evan, Glenn, Katie. I mean, there, there'll be people in the business at the moment who are going to be future leaders, not just in our business, but they'll probably go off and start their own businesses. They'll be very, very successful entrepreneurs in them, themselves. We try to hire other entrepreneurs.
Great. Well, look, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our amazing panel.